Awesome. All right, guys. So welcome, welcome, welcome to our beginner's Bible study. So I, I tried to make it really clear throughout the whole promotion of this, that this is really a beginner's Bible study. I'm talking about like, if you've never picked up a Bible before, I'm really hoping uh, the goal for this, these whole entire eight weeks is that afterwards, if you never join another Bible study again, you're equipped to be able to not only study the Bible on your own, but also be able to teach other people how to do how to do it as well. And so that's my goal for this. I, I pray that you know we accomplish that goal. Uh, so tonight, I kind of wanted to just lay a foundation and go through what the Bible actually is. Shout out to everybody who grabbed the Apologetics Study Bible. Wow, the glare on that is crazy. Uh, the Apologetics Study Bible. This is uh, this is something that was recommended to my recommended to me by my friend Arthur from Apologia Center on YouTube. One of the smartest dudes that I've ever uh, ever encountered. And um, when I when I received it, I was like, wow, this is incredible. I wish I had this study Bible when I first started on my journey, because it not only helps you study the Bible theologically, philosophically, but it also, uh, there's sections of it that answer some of the, the more tough questions that I had when I was coming to faith, when I was trying to figure this stuff out. And um, it's so it's a, it's a really good study Bible. You don't have to have this one. There are, are other really good study Bibles out there as well. I just think this one is really good for a beginner um, and somebody who is just trying to figure this thing out, like how how I was. Part of my goal for my whole um, online, I call it ministry, ministry, uh, is to help people like me who may not have been a Christian and then became Christian. And now you're trying to navigate these waters and you meet people who've been in the church for their whole entire life and they know the Bible front and back. And you're just like, uh, what's up with Leviticus? You know, like you just don't know how to, how to navigate these things. So I'm, um, I'm praying and hoping that, uh, we'll be able to, to after we're done here, that you just feel more equipped and more comfortable. So, Today, what we're going to go through is what is the Bible and is it reliable? Because we could we could have this thing here, but if we don't know how we got it and we're just trusting it on, on blind faith, I mean, I think it is trustworthy. I know it is trustworthy. And hopefully after this session, you'll uh, you'll agree with me. But, um, you know, it, it's it's important to understand what went into us having this right here. We just. um. Uh, you know, we had Halloween, but it was also Reformation Day. Without the Protestant Reformation, we might not even have Bibles in our hands because it was kind of just uh, like the the church leaders had it, and more and people who had money because it, you couldn't mass produce these things. Um, and it's just interesting how God works. That Martin Luther during the Protestant Reformation, when all of that happened, it was around the same time that the printing press was invented. So, boom. Bibles went out to the common man and woman. And so because of that, we have this Bible today. And, and we're also going to go through some of the other challenges that uh, that people had to go through in order. People died so you could have this, uh, just so you're aware. And there's still people in other countries who will die for having it. So it's not just this like like book it's it, it's not just this like little thing that that like oh yeah bible we are blessed in the united states in where we have like a gajillion different translations of this thing but there's there's countries around the world where they have to memorize sections of it because they don't know when when they're when they're going to be able to have it again right so just understand that if you have a bible you are blessed uh, to, to even have access to something like this. All right. So what I'm going to do uh, before we dive into this, I just want to say a quick, quick prayer, because um, if I try to handle this whole thing myself, I'm going to screw it all up. So just going to pray for some guidance real quick. Um, if you guys could just bow your heads, close your eyes, that'd be great. But Father God, just want to say first off, thank you so much for creating a uh, a space like this and and allowing us brothers and sisters in Christ and people who have joined us that aren't even believers yet, but are just interested in learning how to read and study the Bible. We're just grateful that you use 
tools like the internet and like Zoom to connect us from all over the world. We have people from Korea, from South Korea on here, and it would just be impossible to do this without your provision in using something like the internet that so many people use for evil, but you use for good to, to reach people with your word. So we're just praying that um, all of the internet works out well and, and there's no uh, there's no hiccups there. We're also praying that uh, you guide this conversation and that, you know, you, you reach people where they, where they're at and that people come out of this, knowing more about you and knowing more about how to learn more about you through your word. We pray all this in Jesus name. Amen. All right, let's get into it. I got a little slideshow for you guys, right? Cause I can't do anything without a PowerPoint. So, uh, here we go. Is it open? Do I have it? Where is it? It's not open. Of course. One sec. And voila, I am the slideshow king. All right, guys, I'm going to uh, move this thing out of the way. I'm saying it as if you can see it, but you can't. Uh, all right. So introduction to the Bible and its reliability. Um, pressing buttons, nothing's happening. All right. So what is the Bible? The Bible is a, a collection of 66 books. That's a bunch of different diverse literary genres, including history, poetry, prophecy, letters, and more. And next week, we're going to be diving deeper into the different literary genres that are found in the Bible. So it's divided into two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We'll get into that in a little bit. The Old Testament contains 39 books, while the New Testament has 27 books, making it a total of 66 books. Now, some people, when they hear the Bible, they think it's just one book, but it's not. It's a collection of 66 different books written over centuries by about 40 different authors, right? So there's there's a, a collection of books in here. It's essentially a library, uh, you know, between these two covers. You have a library of knowledge given to us by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit using people, right? So what is the Old Testament? Uh, it's the historical, and these are just like, broad overviews. I'm trying to get a lot of information uh, into a little bit of time. So uh, if you have any questions about anything that I'm talking about, write it down, ask it in the Q&A section after, right? So uh, uh, the Old Testament is the historical heritage of, you know, uh, essentially the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, Israel as, as a people, right? Um, their origins, their laws, uh, their ancestral traditions, and Christianity is so closely tied to Judaism because that's where its origins are, which is why you'll see some overlaps, but you'll also see some stark uh, separation too that, that we'll get into as we dive deeper into the, into the Bible, right? So you also find uh, moral and ethical guidelines in the Old Testament, and this is more specifically what was written to the Jews during a period of time uh, when they were in exile, when they were moving into the Promised Land. So you'll see a lot of laws that are specific to that time period and many Jews still practice them today. They carry them all the way over from thousands of years and they still practice this, which is why some of them, you know, don't eat shellfish and uh, and pork and stuff like that because of, of the laws that were formulated thousands of years ago. Right. So you'll also find uh, God's covenant and promises to the Jewish people. You'll find that in there as well, as well as uh, the promises for a future messianic figure and spoiler alert, that messianic figure is Jesus, right? So the the Old Testament is divided into different sections, right? So the first five books of the Old Testament is called the Pentateuch or the Torah, right? And this includes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And this was written between the 15th and 13th centuries. So that's like, like 3,000 years ago, basically. So you're reading something that was written 3000 years ago some of the oldest literature that we have in our hands and and insights into into culture all the way back then that's why a lot of times when archaeologists and historians are looking for something they they go to the bible to see uh to see some clues of where they where they should go start digging and looking 
right? So um, it's written by Moses, and Jesus con confirms this in John chapter 5, verse 46 and 7, 19. It's also confirmed within the Pentateuch itself, but uh, Jesus, you know, we can trust what he says. So he says it's written by Moses. It's written by Moses. I'm going to trust the guy who rose from the dead. Uh, then uh, it, it contains a whole lot of uh, narratives from the creation of the world, the history of early humanity, you know, Cain, Abel, Adam, Eve, uh, laws and commandments given to the Israelites. We'll, we'll dive into that a little bit deeper. Uh, and it, it formed the cornerstone of religious and ethical guidance for Judaism and Christianity. This is why when you hear Judeo-Christian worldview, it's because it's, that worldview is a combination of, of our two traditions put together because Christianity sprung from Judaism, right? So the historical books include everything from Joshua to Esther, right? So Joshua and Judges are believed to have been written around the late 12th to 11th century. Uh, you have Nehemiah and Esther being the later books within that time period, but it covers a time period of, of between six to 700 years. So a lot of times when you read the Bible, you know, you're just flipping one page to the other. You don't know, you, you sometimes don't, uh, don't grasp that when you flip, you might be flipping hundreds of years. It's not just one page to the other. You could be flipping from this page to this page a few hundred years are going by. So keep that in mind when you're reading it. And uh, if you have a good study Bible, it'll let you know that in the beginning. We'll dive into that in our how to read a study Bible, uh, how to use a study Bible class as well. Um, so then we have the wisdom and poetry books. These are some of my favorite. All right. You have Job. So Job is believed to have been written to the uh, between the, the sixth or fifth century B.C., but there's also scholars who think that it's the oldest written book in the in the Bible period. Now, the the narrative is much older regardless because it's talking about a conversation between God and the Satan or Satan, right? So this is some deep stuff and it, it lets you uh I'm I'm going down a rabbit hole of Job, but it really lets you into the 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 spiritual realm and seeing things from God's perspective instead of just, you know, with our two eyes and our human form, we can only see things, uh, you know, the, the furthest we see is our peripheral vision, right? So it gives you a nice insight into, into the spiritual realm. Then you have the Psalms traditionally um, attributed to, to King David. There's also other Psalmists as well. Reading the Psalms is like a roller coaster, right? Some of them you're like, wow, yeah, this is awesome. The other ones you're like, man, this is depressing. And then the other ones you're like, wow, this is incredible. Wow, this is so beautiful. And the other one you're like, wow, I, f I feel you, David. So it's uh, it's it's a roller coaster of emotions going through the Psalms, but it's a it's a collection of poetry. Then you have Proverbs, which is written by King Solomon, who lived around the 10th century BC. So this is this is a, a book that I think everybody. Should read. I mean, I think you should read the whole Bible, but Proverbs is legit. Like it is so incredible when you read it. It's such practical life advice. So you got to think about who it's coming from. Solomon, uh, you know, he could ask God for anything, and he asked God for wisdom. So God granted him wisdom. So he, he this is the wisest. He was the richest man of his time, uh, arguably the richest man in history. Period. This guy had everything. And so he he wrote these things down for his son to to guide to guide him in his life, uh, sections of this, right? So reading it, you can get a lot of knowledge on just how to live your everyday life. And it's a pretty short book, too. Then you have Ecclesiastes, which is it's like listening to an emo song uh, because it's at the end of Solomon's life in where he's had everything and he's just going through how everything in this world is just chasing the wind. Everything is just like, it means nothing without God, right? So it's a, it's a pretty, it's a solemn uh, book to read. And then you have the Song of Solomon, which is a, a little bit spicy. Uh, it's called the Song of Songs as well. So this is a uh, love poetry written by Solomon. So Solomon has added a lot to the Old Testament. He's, he's um, David's son. So King David's son, ar arguably like the greatest king, uh, one of the most popular David and Goliath, uh, one of the most popular figures. And we'll be talking about different uh, popular figures in in the Bible in one of our classes. But that was his son. So really full of wisdom, that guy. Um, moving on. 
So then we have the prophets and more specifically the major prophets. Now, the reason why this section of the Old Testament is called the major prophets is not because they're like more important than the other prophets, but it's basically because they're bigger books, they're, they're longer reads, and there's some content in there that is just really, really important. And uh, so they were written. So Israel has a history of coming to God and then rebelling against him and then coming to him and then rebelling against him. And whenever they rebelled against God, he always sent prophets to be like, hey, Israel, wake up. You got to come back. You got to come back to God. And so there would be all these prophecies of what would happen if Israel did not come back to God or what would happen if they do come back to God. So this was, uh, you know, there's some really deep insights into God's relationship with Israel and God's relationship to us as a, as a, as human beings, right? Now, Isaiah and Daniel both have prophecies about Jesus, the Messiah, and hopefully in another study, we'll get to like really dig into those prophecies. But just if you're looking for that, check those out and, and you could just Google quick, hey, which, um, you know, which which prophecies in Isaiah or Daniel point to the Messiah, point to Jesus, and then you could go a little bit deeper into that as well. But if you have a, a good study Bible, they should be in there already, right? Then you have the minor prophets. So these include all of the other prophets, uh, you know, leading up to Malachi. And Malachi is the is the last book in the Old Testament, right? So the only reason they're called minor prophets is not because they're like, oh yeah, these little prophets over here, like uh, these little minor ones. No, it's just that they were they were shorter. Uh, they're they're much shorter books, but there's also prophecy about Jesus in there as well. Micah, Haggai, Zechariah. So really, really deep stuff there, guys. Now, so I'm telling you what's in the Old Testament, but how do we know we can trust the Old Testament? How do we I, like, yeah, all right, cool. I got this stuff. I, I see who wrote it. I see what it's about. It's I, I see that, you know, it's got poetry, it's got history, but how do I know this is this is legit? Well, I'm gonna try to there's you can really dig into this, but I'm I'm gonna break it down uh in bite-sized pieces. But the process of transmitting the old testament was a meticulous one. They had they had scribes who were dead who they dedicated their whole entire life to just copying the scripture and and it was a meticulous process of copying if if one thing was off it was like oh got to start all over they they would it was it was gruesome like they they really worked hard to to preserve this and I'm going to get into how we know it was preserved correctly in a little bit right so the old testament canonization uh making it in in authority, right? Making it scripture, the word of God occurred around the time of Malachi's completion, right? Uh, Jewish scholars and scribes devoted themselves for centuries to uh, translating and copying the Old Testament to preserve God's revelation, right? So the Old Testament's reliability, you have historical corroboration. Many events, locations, and people mentioned in the Old Testament are corroborated by archaeological and historical findings. I'm going to show you some in a bit. These confirmations provide external evidence for the reliability of the text. And what's interesting is um, you find skeptics out there that will They'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, we, they don't find this in archaeological things. They don't find that. And then all of a sudden, boom, they find it. And then they're like, oh, OK. And then the skeptics got to go find something else to complain about. Like, oh, but they didn't find this yet. So it's like, yo, how much digging you want us to do before you're going to believe? Right. Uh, then you have uh, the manuscript evidence. The Old Testament has a wealth of ancient manuscripts, some dating back to the second century B.C., some before that. These manuscripts have been carefully preserved and pro provide a consistent textual tradition, fulfillment of prophecies. So the Old Testament contains numerous pro prophecies, some of which are seen by believers as having been fulfilled in subsequent historical events, especially in the life of Jesus, right? Then you have cultural continue, uh, continuity. So the Jewish culture reflects uh, many of many like practicing Jews, right? Because uh, there's secular and then there's practicing Jews. Their traditions reflect, they, they date back thousands of years originating in these texts, right? And then just consistency over time. So here's some historical corroboration. Uh, 
the the tell Dan Steely, I know when I first read it, I'm like, what is that? Stell? Steel? You say it like Steely. That's crazy, right? Um, in 1993 is a stone inscription known um this stone had had a mention of King David on it. And this was the first time that that excavators found something, an archaeologist found something that confirmed archaeologically the existence of King David. Now, there's people that we believe existed in the past who don't have like any archaeological evidence for their existence, but we believe they existed simply because they're written about in history. But so when you have not only somebody being written about, but then you find uh, archaeological evidence, this is like a, a historian's dream to find that much evidence for somebody. So it's really cool. And then you have the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the mid 20th century, guys. So these Dead Sea Scrolls were found not too long ago. And it included copies of the Old Testament. And in one of them was the entire book of Isaiah. And these scrolls, they predated the earliest known Hebrew uh, manuscripts by over a thousand years. And they corroborated that the book of Isaiah that we've had and that we've just trusted that was uh, a, as being legit. When we found these scrolls, it showed that there has been no change in them. So let me uh, show you here. So this is the the Tel Dan Steel, uh, Steely, Steely. I still can't say it right. Right. And then this right here. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Right. So uh, it, the uh, don't expect me to say this correctly, but the Mern Pata Stele dated around uh, 1200 BC is an ancient Egyptian inscription that mentions the people of Israel, providing evidence of the existence of the Israelites in the late 13th century. So this means that they have archaeological evidence that shows that the Israelites existed all the way back then, and this is uh this is where it is here. So you guys can. Uh, look into this stuff for yourself. It's really interesting. I have a whole book um, of biblical archaeological discoveries. It's really cool to dig into that stuff. Then you have the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the whole, uh, I believe this is the whole scroll of Isaiah. So, or a portion of it. So it's, it's interesting how, you know, we'll, we'll have these books and then we'll say, man, is this, is this what they were reading back then? Is this what they wrote down back then? And then you have a discovery like this of the Dead Sea Scrolls that shows you that this that it is what we have been reading. It is it lines up with it. So that confirmation is just incredible, right? So then we have uh, so after the Old Testament, we have four hundred years of silence, right? So. The Old Testament ends uh, in Malachi. Then you have, boom, all the way, 400 years. Remember I told you, you switch one uh, one page and then you get to the other and that's the, it could be 100 years. Well, if you switch between Malachi and um, Matthew, you have now just turned 400 years over in one page, right? So what was going on during this 400-year period of silence? So... Here you have uh you had Persian rulership over Judea. You had the Hellenistic influence or or the Greek influence from Alexander the Great, who conquered uh, that whole entire area in the late fourth century. So uh, you had a, a Hellenistic period. Then you had the Maccabean revolt of the second century when uh, the Jewish there, there was a, a big war right where they revolted against the occupying territory, um, and then you have the rise of the Roman Empire in the first century BC. So this is a, a hundred years before Christ. And then it, it trickles over to about 300 years after Christ, the Romans had um, control over the, that whole entire area. And I'll show you a picture of it in a, in a little bit, but also in this time period, you have the, the, the emergence of Jewish sects, right? You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, And if you've ever read the New Testament, you know that they're all up in there. Uh, when when Jesus, who's Jesus always beefing with? The the Pharisees, right? So you um, this is when those groups were developed, right? And we'll dig into to who they are um, in another um. Uh, in another class. Then you have the expectation of a Messiah. So the Jewish people were waiting for this Messiah because you got to understand they're they're expecting somebody to liberate them from 
all of these years of being under control by by different occupying uh, powers, right? So their expectation for a Messiah to free them from this oppression is like on a thousand, right? And what I find interesting is when he actually shows up, they deny that he is the Messiah, right? So this is what the Roman Empire looked like in the first century BC to AD about 150. So this whole entire area. Now, why is this important? The reason why this is important is one, so we can understand the the culture of the time because there's there's a lot of uh, outside influence now on the Jewish culture that's living there. But then also the Roman Empire built roads to connect all of this. You ever heard the saying, all roads lead to Rome? That's where it comes from because they connected everything from this little boot of Sicily all the way down here to Syria, Judea, uh, to to like this whole entire area was controlled by the Romans. Now, this was is how Christianity was able to spread like wildfire. Fire. God's timing is so crazy. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But without all of these roads being connected, without Rome having uh, created all of these highways and and cities. Christianity wouldn't wouldn't have had the ability to spread as fast as it did. So when Rome was trying to like stamp out Christianity, they kind of did it to themselves because they're the ones that built all the highways that connected everything. So they'd stamp it out over here, but it's already grown here. They try to stamp it out over there and it's already grown over there. And it's it was just too much, but it was their own fault for creating the ability for word to travel that fast. But I'm getting a little bit uh, ahead of myself on uh, on that one. But are uh, you guys with me so far? Give me a thumbs up. All right, all right. I know I'm like speeding through this, but I just got a lot of uh, I got a lot of information to uh, to get through. All right. So moving on, moving on. So what is? Let me take a sip of water before I get into this. <sighs> what is the New Testament? Uh, this is where where Jesus is. You can find Jesus all throughout the Old Testament, right? And I, I, there's a a YouTube channel called Jesus in Five that that does a really good job at pointing, uh, showing you where Jesus is in the Old Testament. But the New Testament is that's where Jesus is front and center. This whole thing is is like, hey, here's the Messiah. Here's the Messiah. So, uh, what is the New Testament? The life and teachings of Jesus. Right. Uh, the New Testament begins with the Gospels, which narrate the life and teaching, the life, teachings, miracles, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus is the son of God and the savior of all humanity. And that's because he is right. Then you have the establishment of the church, the Acts of the Apostles. This is uh, another book that you'll find in the New Testament. Remember, I told you it's 27 different books. So the Acts of the Apostles and the epistles or letters written to different churches uh, provide an account uh, of the early Christian church's formation and development. These texts offer guidance on Christian doctrine, ethics, and conduct. Then you have salvation and faith. So the New Testament emphasizes that salvation is found through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And we believe that through his sacrifice, we can be reconciled with God and receive the gift of eternal life. So that's the theme in there of, of how you are saved. It is by faith in Christ. And then you also find in the book of Revelation and also sprinkled throughout the Gospels and the epistles, um, speaking about the end times and the hope that 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 comes with believing Jesus will return, right? And uh, it concludes with the book of Revelation, which contains apocalyptic visions and prophecies and the the hope of the promise of Christ's returns, final judgment, and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom, right? So I'm just going to briefly go through the, the different Gospels and what their focus is on. So the Gospel of Matthew is the first um, is the first book you'll find in your New Testament. It's not the oldest book in the New Testament, but it's just the first one that they use. So this focuses on uh, pointing to Jesus as the long awaited Messiah. If you read just if you start reading in Matthew, right, um, it starts off with just. Uh, with just how Jesus got here, right? His lineage. So what's important to um, to the Jews is tracing your lineage all the way back to Abraham, 
right? So that's what Matthew does in the first chapter. He he just runs through the genealogy of, of Jesus to then also showing because the Messiah was going to be a son of David. So showing that Jesus's lineage came from King David, right? So that's, uh, that's the main focus of this. And it also goes through teachings and, 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 uh, and miracles that Jesus did the sermon on the Mount, which is, uh, even to people who are not Christians, the sermon on the Mount is one of the most, uh, talked about and, and, uh, and, and studied, uh, forms of they would call it philosophy. We call it a word from God, but um, just ethical teachings that you find in there that you do not find anywhere else, right? Um, then you have the Gospel of Mark. So this is uh, action oriented. It's known for its brevity. It's only sixteen chapters. It's really quick. You could read the Gospel of Mark in one sitting, right? You could read the whole New Testament in one sitting. It take you about like eight hours, but it's pretty short, right? So. It, uh, it gives vivid descriptions of Jesus's healings and exorcisms, casting out demons, right? Um, it also emphasizes the disciples' struggles, right? So these, these disciples and early apostles, they weren't these like perfect, heroic, you know, if I was going to write a book uh, about something, if I was going to say like, hey, we're going to worship this guy, Jesus, and I was there for it. I'm going to make myself look incredible. I'm not going to tell you about the struggles that I went through. I'm not going to tell you about when I doubted my faith. I'm just not going to do that. And especially if I was a, a Jew in that culture at the time, I'm not going to do that. So the fact that these gospels highlight the shortcomings and the abandoning Jesus that the dis, that the, his early disciples did, it's actually, uh, it attests to the fact that these are how the events actually played out in real life, right? So then you have the Gospel of Luke. This is, uh, so Luke was a physician and you could tell by reading it that he was just a very educated, detail-oriented um, man. He he goes through the birth of uh, John the Baptist, then he uh, details the what led up to Jesus's birth and it's it's really in depth and uh Luke is often noted for his attention to historical and chronological detail it includes the birth narratives as i just said of John the Baptist and Jesus as well as accounts of various encounters and parables not found in the other gospels right so Matthew Mark Luke and Matthew Mark and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because if you read them there's a lot of overlap that happens right you'll be after you read Matthew, you go read Mark and you're like, I feel like I just read this because there's a lot of overlap in them. Same thing with uh, with Luke. You'll read a lot of the same things that that happen. But when you get to John, his focus is a little bit different. There's some overlap, definitely, because it's still describing uh, the life of Jesus. But the Gospel of John starts off uh, in the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh. It's focusing on Jesus's identity, the word being Jesus, right? So it's uh, that's that's what John's gospel is all about, is letting you know who Jesus is. This is the son of God. This is God in the flesh. It gives the seven I am statements that you will always hear coming up on uh, Easter. You'll see all the YouTubers making uh, making videos about that. But, you know, like I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the resurrection and the life. It has the famous John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There is, John's one of my favorite. I think because I'm thinking about doing another Bible study after and just like going through um, each chapter of each book. I might, I, I want to just start with Matthew, but I love John so much. I might just, I might just jump right into that. Um, so then you have the acts of the apostles. So this comes after John. Uh, this was written by Luke as well. So if you read Luke and then go read the acts of the apostles, it's kind of just like a continuation of it because this is after Jesus uh, was crucified after he resurrected, after he ascended into heaven. This is a, a 40 year period of uh, the early church and what was going on and, and what the apostles were doing, how they were spreading the word. You also find the conversion of Saul of Tarsus into Paul, the apostle in here as well. And Paul ends up writing almost half of the new Testament. So, you know, this is, um, Acts is really, it's really in-depth if you want to know how the apostles used 
what Rome set up and 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 just spread all over and and got the word out there to to all of the known world at that time and beyond. Excuse me, I'm getting a little dry here. Uh, you also learn about the Christian persecution that they were facing and the difficulties that they had to go through in order to get the word out there. You also find out about uh, Stephen, who was the first martyr. Uh, he was the first Christian killed, and he was actually killed while Paul was holding people's jackets. The, he was holding the cloaks of the people who were killing him, who were killing Stephen. So that that's how bad of a dude Paul was, Saul, uh, before he became Paul. And then Paul goes on and writes uh, almost half of the New Testament. The way that God uses people uh, of the most unlikely kind is just incredible. So speaking of Paul, Paul wrote the Pauline epistles, right? So these are letters to different churches. It starts with Romans. Um, then you have Galatians. You have First and Second Corinthians. You have uh, First and uh, you have First Timothy, Second. T you have all of these letters are written by Paul. So these are for doctrinal and practical guidance. So Paul was writing to churches about their problems that they had at the church. So if you think that you know it's just the modern church that has problems, no church always has problems. So Paul, look, if if Paul was still around today, we'd be getting letters from him. All right. Like that's just just the way it is. We would be getting letters from him. So um it's practical guidance. So you you could find um Christian living there. Like how are we supposed to operate inside and outside of the church? What what does it mean to to walk with Christ? What does a Christ like life look like? There's also um you, you know instruction on on how to run a church, on what are the qualifications for being a pastor or an elder or an overseer. So this is really deep stuff um, into, into not only that, but also you find here Paul honing in on the gospel of grace, of really focusing on how we are saved, how we are made righteous. Uh, and it's through the work of Christ, not of any works that we do, but through the work of Christ, the finished work of Christ on that cross. And just by putting our faith in Christ and that finished work, we're saved. Is there's no works that we can do uh, to get us into heaven? Jesus did it all. So Paul spends a lot of time reiterating that. So I really suggest reading the Pauline epistles. I mean, I suggest reading the whole entire Bible, you know. But um, then you have the general uh, epistles, right? So this is written by Peter, written by James, written by John, Jude. Um, so these are also same thing. Practical guidance. These letters offer uh, practical guidance of living a faithful Christian life. Um, it also points out false teachers. Paul talks about that as well. But um, there's a, there's like a, a focus on this because there was false teachers. So Paul would go and uh, help build up a church. And then Paul would leave or any of the apostles. They would go help build up a church. They would leave. And then right behind them came these false preachers and false teachers trying to undo everything and some of them with good intentions you know but they they were teaching false doctrine and usually when you hear that it's adding works to it uh so yeah and then you also find encouragement in there there's a lot of encouragement in in uh james so then you have the book of revelation right I'm running out of water over here i'm using uh i have like a little bit left here a little bit left there a little bit left here so the book of revelation this is like this is everybody's favorite book to misrepresent. Um, it's uh, it's really, really deep. And and there's so many different perspectives on it. You have a preterist view. You have a historical view. You have a future, futuristic view. It's some deep stuff. And it takes a lot of study to understand it because it's, it's highly symbolic, right? So this is apocalyptic text. It's filled with imagery that, that conveys spiritual truths. So it's, it's, uh, in a way, allegorical, but also literal at the same time. It's just so, so deep. But it, this is about the end times, right? Uh, when Jesus is coming back and what that's going to look like. So if there's one thing we can uh, we can bank on is that Jesus is coming back, right? Um, so that's what you find in there as well. And this was written by John. So this was uh, John is one of the only apostles to not be martyred and not be killed. They exiled him 
to the island of Patmos. And on the island of Patmos, he wrote the book of Revelation because it was revealed to him by Christ. It's it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? Revealed to John about the end times. And this closed the New Testament. So that is the last book that you find in the New Testament. Are you guys still with me? Give me thumbs up. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So now New Testament reliability. So when I was trying to figure this whole thing out, and I'm going to give you guys, I'll write this in the uh, the chat as well. I'm going to give you guys a movie to watch as like homework, quote, homework. Um, but uh, when I was trying to figure out if I'm going to do the Jesus thing, if I'm going to just maybe be agnostic, if I, when I was really just trying to figure this thing out and figure out what reality is, um, I really, wow, what an amazing, I just need to give a shout out to my wife. She um, just showed up with a glass of water. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. She's listening in on the other side. Am I going too fast? Yeah, I'm gonna slow. I'm gonna slow down a little bit. I'm sorry. I just I know how many slides I got. That's why I'm like speeding through this. Um, so the New Testament reliability. So the New Testament has a wealth of ancient manuscripts dating back to the second century AD. There's there's even manuscripts before that, right? Oh, I've got to move this. Um, they allow scholars to compare and cross-reference texts. So we have thousands, guys, thousands of New Testament manuscripts. And you got to understand, this means a lot because when it comes to piecing together history, you... You only get like one or two manuscripts, sometimes three, four manuscripts when when putting something together and be like, oh, yeah, this probably happened in history. But the fact that the New Testament has thousands, it's like my, it's a it's a historian's dream. It's like, wow, we have all of this that we can we can look into. And I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So you have multiple at attestations. So as I was saying, the um, you know, you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke. These were all written by different people in different areas, uh, but also written either by eyewitness or um, written from the testimony of eyewitnesses of the events that that went on. So the fact that you have multiple attestations, this is how like in a court of law, if you if you got one witness, it's like, all right, yeah, we could believe that witness. But if you have multiple witnesses of something and they're both all of their testimonies are corroborating. You're like, yeah, this probably happened, even if some of the details are off a little bit. But if the main theme of the story is is happening, that's how you can get a, a conviction, right? By having multiple witnesses. So the fact that we have so many is just incredible. And then you have archaeological confirmation as well, um, you know, dating, uh, showing that these people and these places and these events happened in the way that they did, right? You also have extra biblical um attestation as well right so you have cultural and historical context the new test so what's really cool about this is it it really gives you a look into the cultural atmosphere of the time and you can compare like if if the new testament and all these gospels were later forgeries they would not have these things that line up with other ancient documents that we have at that time about those cultures so the fact that they mesh perfectly with the time is another reason why we look at them as reliable, right? Consistency in the message, as I was just saying, despite having been written by various authors in different locations and times, the New Testament maintains a consistent message about the life teachings, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, highlighting the unity of the Christian faith. You have external sources. So some events and figures mentioned in the New Testament are corroborated by external sources, such as historical records and writings from the same time period. So if you look into like Josephus and Tacitus and Pliny the Younger, these are all people who had, we're not Christians. They had nothing to do with the New Testament, but they wrote about Jesus and his movement uh, around the same time. So these are extra biblical um, evidence for the life of Jesus Christ, right? So that's important because a lot of times when you're expressing your faith to somebody or you're talking to somebody about your faith, they'll they'll say, oh, but you know, you believe what the Bible says. Like, it's just, you know, how are you going to trust the Bible? It's bias. Well, 
we have other sources outside of the Bible that corroborate what the Bible says. So there's that skeptic. Um, so, uh, so the New Testament canon, first let's define what canon means, right? So the, the canon is essentially just the books that are in the Bible. What, what we have right now is, is called the canon, right? Meaning this other book that claims that it should be in the Bible isn't in the Bible because it's not canonical, can, canonical, right? So when you hear, when, I remember when I first heard canon, I literally thought like canons, like pirate ship canons. I'm like, what are they talking about? New Testament canons. They had canons? Like it didn't make any sense to me, right? So uh, how did we get the New Testament? There's a lot of myths that come with this, right? And you'll hear them all the time. I call them like memes. They're myth memes. So myth number one, the Council of Nicaea established the New Testament canon. One of the most persistent myths is that the Council of Nicaea determined which books would be in the New Testament. In reality, the Council of Nicaea primarily addressed theological matters such as the nature of Christ and did not discuss the New Testament canon. The New Testament canonization process was an, was ongoing for centuries and not settled at Nicaea. So the Council of Nicaea wasn't about like picking the books that are going in the Bible that create the canon. That's not what it was about. There was a, it was called the um, Arian heresy in which they were saying Jesus was a created being. And uh, you find this also still prevalent today in like Jehovah's Witness. They believe that Jesus was a created being, that he's not eternal with the Father. So there was a council to discuss that, but that council was not to pick the uh, the books of the Bible. So another myth was that Constantine decided the canon. Uh, so this was uh, another misconception is that the Roman Emperor Constantine played a de decisive role in forming the New Testament canon. While Constantine did convert to Christianity and called the First Council of Nicaea, he did not make decisions about the New Testament canon. So another myth, the canon was decided by a single council. Some people believe that there were that there was a single council, all-encompassing council, that definitively determined the New Testament canon. In reality, the process involved multiple councils and discussions over several centuries. Different regions and communities had their own collection of text, texts, and consensus gradually emerged over time. Right? So I don't know if you guys ever heard the story where it was like they just like threw books on the table and whichever ones fell those were the ones that they put in. It's all myths, right? Another myth, the canon was decided by a small church, a small group of church leaders. Some myths suggest that a small group of church leaders, perhaps a secretive committee, made unilateral decisions about the canon. The reality is that the canonization process involved a wide range of Christian communities, leaders, and scholars, and it was a collaborative, decentralized process. Excuse me. Another myth, the canon was settled early in Christian history, right? So the canonization process was not settled in early Christian history, but extended over several centuries. While some texts were widely accepted relatively early, others took longer to gain recognition. The final list of canonical books was not formally ratified until the fourth century. So the, the New Testament, as we have it right now, it wasn't uh, recognized until hundreds of years after Christ. And you'll understand why as we go through this, right? So myth, non-canonical texts were all suppressed. So you'll hear myths like, uh, oh, the gospel of Thomas is the real, like they, they didn't want this in the Bible. It's like, no, that's a later forgery from hundreds of years later after Christ. Like the gospel of Judas, not, we just found that uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like these things are not in the Bible for a reason. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So some believe that all non-canonical texts were intentionally suppressed by the early church. While certain texts were considered heretical and were actively rejected, many non-canonical texts were preserved and remain valuable for understanding early Christian beliefs and practices, but are just not considered inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? So we believe that this Bible is inspired, that God used people inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down what he wants them to write down. So if something is not in this book, it's because we don't believe that it's written, uh, that it is uh, directly from God through people, right? So here are some truths. 
this was a gradual development. The formation of the New Testament canon was a you just I just lost you. Hold up. I think my my camera just like shut off. Am I there yet? Oh yeah. Nope. What happened? Give me a sec. All right. I see myself there, but I don't see myself here. Let me, uh, do you guys see me at all? Give me one second. Stop sharing. Give me one second, guys. Technical difficulties. All right, we are good to go. We are good to go. Awesome. Sorry about that. Let me get right back in action. All right. So, where was I? Yes, so the formation of the New Testament canon was a gradual process that spanned several centuries. It did not occur at a single moment or through a decision of any single council. The New Testament contains texts authored by various individuals, including apostles such as Paul and John and their associates such as Luke and Mark. These texts were recognized based on their apostolic authority or close association with the apostles. So you can't just claim... Uh, to to be like, yeah, I was with Jesus. No, you had to be authenticated. They had to look into your history and say, yeah, we're we're not going to listen to you, buddy. You you don't even know what you're talking about. Nobody knows nobody knows you, fam. Right? Like that's that's the mentality. So then, uh, the acceptance of a text into the New Testament canon was often based on its widespread recognition and use within early Christian communities. Texts that were widely read, quoted, and used in worship held a stronger claim for inclusion. Then you have theological consistency, right? So the theological content and orthodoxy of a text played a crucial role in its acceptance in the canon. So this is why something like the Gospel of Thomas is not in the Bible, not only because it was written hundreds of years later, but it's just the Jesus that you find there doesn't line up to the historical Jesus that we know. It doesn't line up to the his, to the Jesus you find in the Gospels and all throughout Scripture, right? So then you had local and regional variations. So different Christian communities and regions had their own collection of texts as they considered authoritative. These collections varied, and some texts were recognized in certain areas, but not universally. Consensus gradually emerged over time, right? So the reason why all of these are put in here is because if you put them all next to each other they all intermesh they all connect with each other if you just throw something else in there that has nothing to do with all of this of course it's not going to be in the bible doesn't matter how popular it is it's just not going to be in there right so then you had uh church councils right that came together like the council uh, of hippo and carthage in north africa and the council of laodicea they issued lists of canonical books that aligned with the emerging consensus. So it's not like they said, it's not like they said, hey, we council say these books are in the Bible. It was the no, we council agree that the consensus among believers is that these books 
are inspired by the Holy Spirit, that these books are uh, the inspired word of God and therefore canonical, right? Now, one of the biggest difficulties, right, is that early Christians faced periods of intense persecution, uh, particularly during the first three centuries of the Common Era. This persecution led to the dispersion of Christian communities across different regions of the Roman Empire. So you got to think about it like this. How could they have a council to decide the books of the Bible if they're being persecuted? They can barely meet together. So if they can't meet together, they can't be like, oh yeah, these are the ones. And this is like the beauty of God. Just the fact that he was able to preserve this message through 300 years of intense persecution. And we still have the letters of Paul and we still have uh, the gospel of John and we still have uh, the, all the epistles. And the fact that we even still have this after it was, uh, after uh, the Roman empire was trying to stamp Christianity out. I think that's a miracle in itself. Right. So then you have a uh, limit, limited written text. So the earliest Christians did not have a comprehensive New Testament as it's known today. They only had a limited number of written texts, such as letters from apostles. So let's say Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians. He wrote two of them, but let's just say that letter to the Corinthians, only the Corinthians had it for, for a specific amount of time because it was a letter written to them. It was then spread to other churches as a way to show, hey, this is what Paul is saying here uh, of, of how to run a church. So they spread it around so other people could learn from it as well, right? So, and then you had the scarcity of counsel as I was just uh, discussing as well. They can't just come together at, under persecution and have a council. I think about like, um, so the Edict of Milan is, um, is when Constantine made Christianity legal. Right. When it was no longer where Christians had to hide, they could now practice their faith openly. I think about like the first council they probably had was full of Christians that had like scars on their faces and like missing arms and and like um, like having limps and and disabilities. I think about like the early church. They were some tough men and women. Like they really were some tough people because they had to fight through all of this persecution. So I could imagine, you know, I feel like uh, not in all churches, but in many churches today, we have this. Um, like if something just doesn't feel good, we run from it, you know, oh, this hurt my feelings. I'm gone. I just imagine how tough the those first few centuries of Christianity were and, and how how tough those Christians were and I, I think about that and I, I try to um put myself in their shoes and and I wonder would I have persevered under that? You know, it's just something to to really think about. So despite all the challenges uh of persecution and limited formal gatherings, a consensus gradually emerged among various Christian communities about the texts and you know, they were that they considered authoritative and apostolic. Over time, certain texts gained widespread recognition. So, boom, the Edict of Milan was issued by uh, Roman emperors Constantine and Licinius in 313 AD, marking a turning point and granted religious tolerance to Christians, effectively ending the period of official persecution. This newfound freedom allowed for more open and formal discussions within the Christian community and the resilience of the early Christians. God used uh, the early Christians to preserve the texts that we now know as the New Testament. It's just a miracle. And it's just one more reason why we can trust the Bible we have in our hands today, right? So now I'm just going to briefly talk about the Bible translation process. I know this. So I just want you guys to know the the classes we have moving forward are going to be much more focused. Uh, this is more like a, like a shotgun blast of information that I'm giving you guys because I just I just want you to to understand that what you have in your hand, it it's legit. This is from God and He preserved it over thousands of years for us to be reading. And so I'm just hoping that I'm doing a good job of uh, of giving you some background on on how important this collection of books is, right? So the uh, 
the Bible translation process. So they use source texts now. So translators, I'm talking about modern translators now, right? Uh, and all throughout the generations, it was it was translated into different languages over time. But I'm like trying to lead us to how we get uh, our our modern English translations. So they begin by selecting the source texts that they will use most, <clears throat> excuse me, Most modern translations are based on the original languages of the Bible, primarily Hebrew for the Old Testament and Greek for the New Testament. So Greek was the language of the land at the time of Jesus, right? Um, they also, um, this group of, of Jews, since they recognized that, uh, that the Greek language was so prevalent, they translated the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, what we call, into Greek, and that's what's called the Septuagint. So what's very interesting is sometimes when you read uh, Jesus quoting the Old Testament or Paul quoting the Old Testament, they actually quote from the Septuagint, the Greek, because that was the one that most people were were reading at the time, right? Then you have uh, textual criticism. So textual, sc textual scholars compare and analyze different manuscripts and fragments to determine the most accurate and reliable wording of the original texts. This process is called textual criticism and helps ensure the accuracy of the translation. So these Bibles that we have take years upon years upon years uh, translating from the actual manuscripts to English, right? So there's no like, there's this there's this myth that goes around that it's like, oh yeah, it's translated to Hebrew, then translated to this, then translated to German, then translated to this, then translated to that, and translated, and then we got the English translation. No, that's not how it works anymore. We we have the original manuscripts. We have directly from ancient Hebrew into the Old Testament, from Koine Greek into the New Testament. That's there's no middlemen in between, right? So the translation committee is a team of scholars often comprising linguistics, uh, linguists. I'm talking so much I can't say anything anymore, right? This word right here, okay? Linguists, linguists, there we go. Theologians uh, and experts in biblical languages work together to translate the Bible. This committee represents various denominations and traditions to ensure a well-rounded translation. Translation philosophy. Translators must decide on a, a translation philosophy, which can rain, range from word for word. That's called a formal equivalence or a thought for thought, a dynamic equivalent. So essentially this, there are certain translations that Try to make it word for word. Like here we have this Greek word. We want to translate that directly to an English word. And then there's others like the NIV, which looks at the whole sentence and says, all right, so let's just transfer the meaning of the sentence. And then you have paraphrases and everything. So you can read at the beginning of every Bible. They'll tell you what process they used and what kind of translation you're getting right in front of you. So you can determine which kind is better for you. If you like the English Standard Version, the American Standard Version, the NIV, they're all, they all pretty much say the, um, the message is always the same. You'll find different words um, here and there, but then you can always go and look at like Blue Letter Bible and look at what, what this sentence said in Greek, right? So, sorry, I'm going on a, a, a tangent. Uh, so then we have uh, cultural and linguistic expertise. So translators consider the cultural and linguistic context of the target audience. They aim to make the Bible accessible and meaningful to contemporary readers while staying true to the original meaning. So they just translators today are trying to make the Bible easy for us to read. Like a lot of people like the King James, the, the King James version of the Bible. I think it's a beautiful translation. When I read it, I feel smart, but is it easy for the average, everyday, brand new Bible, uh, brand new Christian who's trying to read the Bible? Probably not, especially for the younger generation. They're going to have no idea what's going on over there. So, you know, sometimes that's why I, I say like, yeah, try reading the NIV, try reading the ESV, something that's a little bit more main, mainstream, modern, 
uh, English, even the New King James, right? So then you have the review and editing. So translators undergo undergo multiple rounds of review, editing, and peer scrutiny. The translation committee, along with external scholars and experts, assess the accuracy, clarity, and faithfulness of a translation. So if you're reading a Bible that doesn't go through all this, you should probably go find a different one, like the message or the passion translation. Those are like weird paraphrases, right? If you're trying to really deep dive and learn the Bible, those are not the, the best. Then you have uh, beta testing. So some publishers conduct beta testing where they target readers to provide feedback on translations, clarity, and readability. So I'm just trying to get you guys to understand there's a lot that goes into getting you this Bible, right? Then you have theological considerations. Translators make theological decisions such as rendering terms related to God, Christology, and salvation in ways consistent with the theological tradition for which the translation is intended. Then you have accessibility. So modern translations aim to be inclusive. So there's, um, if you look in like back in the day, right? Mankind is, uh, or like all men, when these words didn't literally mean just all men, it meant everybody. So what translators do is when uh, the Bible is specifically talking about men, they leave men. But when it means like everybody, they then translate it into everybody so they take those uh they take those opportunities to make it more readable so we can understand it uh in in our modern way of speaking right and then you have continual revision so bible translators are, are not translations are not static and may go may undergo revisions over time to account for changes in the understanding of the original texts and shifts in language using so as language changes and different words start meaning different things People who translate the Bible, they they follow the language of the times so that way we're always able to read it and understand it, right? So modern Bible translations seek to balance the preservation of the original biblical message with making it accessible to contemporary readers. The process is a collaborative effort involving experts from various fields to provide readers with accurate, clear, and relevant translations of the Bible. So in conclusion... You guys made it. Uh, in conclusion, you can trust that what you're reading is what God wants you to be reading. He has preserved it through centuries to make sure that you and I have the opportunity to learn from him and to know him. So stopping the share. So I know I said a lot and I said it really fast, but I'm hoping that if you were paying attention and, and if you listened, that you just have a better understanding for what it is that you have in your hands and that you can you can trust that what you have is what God wants you to be reading, that he took the time using people to get this to you over centuries and persecution and the burnings of libraries and and. Uh, burning down of churches and like it still made it to you. It's a miracle in in and of itself. So with all that being said, guys, I am open for some Q and a, if you, if you got to go, you can go. Um, and if you uh, also, Oh, I'm the host now. Sweet. Uh, and also, I have I just added a tab to the Bible study page on the whyjesusnetwork.com where if you think of a question that you didn't get to ask during this time, you can just send it in and I'll directly send you an answer. And if I don't have the answer, I will do my best to get it for you. So there's a way where you can like raise your hand, um, not like physically like that, but uh, there's a way to... Um, like there's a button. Yeah, right there. Alexander got his hand raised. So I'm going to unmute Alexander. So that's how it works. I don't know how you find that thing, but Alexander found it. All right, just oh. click to unmute you. Um, oh, hold on. Let me, before you start talking, let me put on my headphones because otherwise we're going to catch some crazy echo. You got it. Can you hear me? We're good. Yeah, I could I could hear you, but I'm just trying to get this thing. Uh, I think I just connected to my phone. 
All right. Uh, say something. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. And can you guys hear him? Give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Perfect. Awesome. So uh, first off, thank you so much uh, for holding this. I uh, definitely learned a lot. Um, I have a question. I don't know if it's too deep or if it's too theological. Do you want me to just ask you? You can tell me whether you can answer this. Um, so as long as it's in alignment with with, uh, with what we're talking about today, I'll, I'll do my best to do it. I just kind of want to stay on topic. Um, so if it's in alignment with what we're talking about today, then yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to answer. And if I don't have a, a answer or I think it's too deep, we can uh, you know just uh, save it for another time. Okay, so I guess I'll just I'll just ask and you can let me know if you yeah. should bring this up later. Uh, what do you think about sensationism? And do you think that there's enough scripture to support that view? Because I just finished watching the documentary that was recently released. I'm kind of conflicted. Like it did bring up yeah. some good points, but I just want to hear it from you. I don't know if it's too deep to, to get into that. So, radical. all right. So for those of you, yeah, this is a beginner's Bible study. So uh, yeah, I know, I, I know I it's a super should... deep question. It is a super yeah, deep that's su that's super deep. So cessationism means uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased, and then uh, continuationism means that you believe that they've continued. I, I would consider myself a biblical continuationist, but even even in my description, some people would think I'm a cessationist. But yeah, that's that's it's too deep for uh okay, for this. Got you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, Let's, I'll just beginner be... <laughs> beginner yeah. questions. No, it's a really good question though. Yeah, no, I was just wondering. I was just wondering. I'll 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 mute myself and I'll let somebody else ask a more basic question. All right. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. All right, I got Haley. Haley, what up, sis? Oh, I I tried to press it and then I didn't press it. No, I go. pressed it. We pressed it at the same time. Uh, hi, hi, John. What's up? What's up, Gio? What up, what up, what up? Um, I know you just went through the whole um preservation topic. Can you like make it in like lamest terms, like like just for your basic um person that's saying, oh, your Bible's translated, oh, your Bible's this, your Bible's that. So like, what is a basic like response that's not this big breakdown of like the preservation? Yeah, of the yeah. Bible? <laughs> I well, I would just ask them, uh, what do you mean by that? Right, like that. That would be the first go to. I, I ask for clarity all the time when somebody says, "Oh, your Bible is trans," because they don't. These are. Uh, it's it's like they're they're parroting something that they've heard and they don't even really understand what it is that they're saying. So whenever somebody's like, oh, you you know, the Bible's been mistranslated, I would say, well, how do you know it's mistranslated if you don't have the uh, original translation? What is it mistranslated from? How, what is the original translation? Could you tell me? Oh, nah, well, we don't have this. And then how do you know it's mistranslated? Mm -hmm. You know, but I would just say, and you got to be kind. I don't, uh, I don't ever want to get into like a, like a, you know what I mean? Sometimes I want to, but I don't allow myself to. Um, but it's, you just got to ask them one for clarity. How did you come to that conclusion? Normally they have no idea how they came to that conclusion. Oh, um, it was written by a man. How do you trust it? How can you trust that it was written by a man? I say, so is everything. <laughs> Everything's written by man. All your science books, all your history books, all everything is written by man. How? Yeah. You're if you're texting me right now, that's written by man. How do I know you? It's not your mom texting me. You know, like it's these are just things that they're 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 parroting something, right? So uh just when it comes to oh, you don't have the real translation, just ask, what do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? And then say, Well, are you aware that we actually have the the Hebrew text that we directly translate from? We actually have the Greek text that it's directly translated from. We have thousands of manuscripts. Are, are you aware of that? And just ask them if they're aware of that and then point them to a resource uh, because they're normally just saying it to like get at you when you're, you know, we're, uh, I'm assuming most people on here are beginners when it comes to this. Um, but it, it's when you first become a Christian, you become more bold about your faith. You're going to get pushback, but Trust me, pushback is a great way to learn because if somebody says to you, oh, you know, it was just translated, uh, mistranslated, blah, blah, blah. You don't got to answer somebody right away. You say, you know what? Let me look. Let me go look into that. 
And then it gives you an opportunity to go do more research and find out how we got the Bible. Well, how it, how do we know um, it was translated correctly? And you can you, you can take it as a learning opportunity. See, they're trying to shut you down, but now you go deeper into it and you go learn. And now your faith is uh, is is uh, deeper. That's what happened with me. A lot of uh, you know, I have atheist friends. I have friends from other religions, and they said some wild stuff to me when I first started speaking about my faith. And I was like, you know, let me, let me go look into that. And then when I really researched into it, I was like, wow, there's answers for these questions. And they make more sense than the person just trying to uh, shut down my faith. Right. So, um, and so before anyone signs off, um, there's a movie I want you guys to watch called the case for Christ. Um, it's, there's a book, on it as well but i remember doing all of this research and then i watched the movie the case for christ and i was like you mean i could just watch this movie right um so uh no it's not a documentary it's a uh so it's sort of a documentary it's about um this guy lee strobel's life and he went on a journey to disprove christianity and then he ended up being a christian right so really really good uh really good movie might be free on Amazon Prime. I'm I'm not too sure, but uh, did that answer I your question? I just bought Christianity. Oh, you I did just nice. That, and that's that reminded a, me of that. Yep, that's solid. That one's solid. So that'll that'll give you a lot of answers that you're um that you just asked me right now. So definitely dive into that. Thank All you. Right. All right. Let's see, uh, Geo's got her hand up. Oh, was there somebody else? Oh yes. Let me I'm gonna come to you soon, my beautiful wife. All right, Stephanie, what's up? Did I did I click it? Uh, you know what happens? I, I move my, my mouse to click and then what at the time that I'm pressing it, Zoom moves the, the camera and then I, I miss it. So can't hear you. I'm gonna hit it one more time. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I didn't even raise my hand, so I don't know where that came oh. from. <laughs> I didn't have any questions. You did a great oh. job. So I don't know what that was about. <laughs> All right. Well, let me uh, remute you. <laughs> All right. Uh, where did Gio go? I just clicked to unmute you. It's not happening. It's you have to accept. You have to accept the unmute. I did. You can't hear me? Oh, yeah. We're good to go. Okay. Um, I saw somebody ask if you're going to share the slides, John. Are you going to share these? Oh, yeah. I'm going to upload them uh, and, and then send them out. Uh, let me open the chat. My bad, guys. I'm sorry. I was just like rambling and talking and talking and talking. Um, yeah, I'm going to put them in the in the chat. And I'm also going to email them out when I make the announcement for next week's. I put, I, when I say put them in the chat, I mean I'm going to put them in the Telegram. I can't find the, the chat. There we go. All right. Uh, so Melinda says the movie is on Pure Flix. So that's like the Christian Netflix. Uh, and also Alexander says it's the movie is on YouTube for free, he thinks. Um, how did the... The message and the passion translation rise to prominence if the translations typically go through such a thorough process of legitimization. That's a good question, Naja. So there's different types of translations. So those are called paraphrase translations. And if you look into the passion translation, like uh, if you look into how he translated that, it's like some weird new age stuff, right? Um, so anyone can just go translate a Bible. I'm talking about the credible ones. Like there's a pirate Bible out right now that somebody translated with AI. So anyone can translate a Bible. I'm just, when, when I say Bible translations that are good to read, I mean ones that went through the process that I, that I spoke about. You have ones that have not gone through that deep, uh, that, that deep process that I just described. So if, that's why I say look into how the Bible was created. The one that you're reading, like this one, uh, this is the Christian Standard Bible. And it went through a rigorous, rigorous uh, ringer of um, 
of textual criticism and making sure that the message came across right. So that's uh that's that. Um, sorry, I'm scrolling. All right, does anyone have any more questions? I know we late. Don't be scared either. There's no question that is uh, you know, this is a beginner's Bible study, so answer and ask any questions that come to you that come to mind. I'll give it like two minutes and then if if there's no questions, we will sign out and I'll we'll post all this. Oh, I have a quiz too that I'm gonna post in the group. Um and uh, it's just like a 25 question quiz just for you to like get a little refresher. Don't worry, I'm not going to be great in you or anything. All right, Jocelyn, what's up? I hit the button. Hi, can you hear me? Hey, hey, what's up? Yes. Hey, everyone. So I'm really a brand new Christian. I've been in another Bible study, but they were kind of just like reading scriptures and not really explaining the way you explained it. Love it. I had asked a question before, and I'm going to ask it again because like when you're and when you were talking and saying if you have a question, it keeps coming to my head just out okay. of curiosity because I live in an area where there's people that try to like grab you and say like, oh, come to my church, right? When when you're trying to find a home church, you're intrigued. And so there's been a couple of people that have stopped me and then they talk about the Book of Mormon. And then when I mentioned it in the other Bible study, they said, if you're Christian, you do not believe in that. And that's right. all like they really said. And I want someone to explain to me as to why the, the one thing they said was that they believe in three separate entities. But again, not explained. And then you're talking about like books that were not mentioned in the Bible and left out. And I'm just curious as to if that was one of them. So what I'll do for you, I'm going to post in the tele you're in the telegram, Jocelyn. Yes. All right. So I'm going to post a video from a man named Mike Winger about Mormonism. And it's he goes through why it does not line up with Christianity. Right. And in the little five seconds that I'll answer you right now, they, they have like doctrines that they say that Jesus is Satan's brother and that we are all uh, that Jesus was a human that became God. And when we all have the potential to become gods and then we get our own planets mm -hmm. in in the next life and that uh god yahweh the god of israel had a wife and there's just a whole lot of uh stuff that is just like where'd you get this bro um okay. so but that's like a you know a little nutshell of it but i'm going to post that mike winger video in the telegram and you could go down a rabbit hole listening to Mike Winger stuff. He's a much better teacher than I am. Um, and you'll learn a lot. And he's pretty like, you know, he, he does a good job at explaining it so anyone can understand it um, from uh, it doesn't matter what denomination you are. It doesn't like he he does a really good job at breaking stuff down. So I hope that answers your question, Jocelyn. Thank you. I asked because like when they approach me and I'll say, oh, I'm Christian. And they're like, OK, me too. And then I'll be like, wait, but you mentioned the Book of Mormon. I've, I've never heard that before. And I've heard negative things about it. And they're like, no, it, we're Christian. And, and if you come to our church, we'll explain more. And I'm like, OK, no, I'm good. <laughs> so All right. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you how to handle it, Jocelyn. Right. Somebody grabs you, punch him in the face and that's it. Keep it moving. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, just just be kind. And what, what I would also try to do is um, build a try to be really kind, build a relationship because these are people that God is having you meet. For, I'm, I'm looking at you right here. I got to look over here. So this is uh, people that God's having you meet that you could potentially, hopefully down the line, if you're if you're kind and you're cordial and you, you maybe get their information, that you could actually share the real gospel with them and and help them break out of that cult. So, you know, just always don't, you know, I know the number one thing, especially us in like New York area, it's like, so you don't, don't talk to me, fam. Like, uh, so the fact that they're trying to talk to you, just use that and say, all right, God, I'm going to, 
I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be cordial. Like I've went to Jehovah's Witnesses churches just to continue to build my relationship with, uh, with friends. I'm not saying like, I'm not saying for you to do that, but you know, they invited me knowing that I, I don't believe that stuff. And, you know, I, I went just out of like, Hey, thank you for inviting me. And then we had a discussion of why I don't believe that stuff, you know? So it's, uh, it's, you gotta, you gotta walk these things. And I'm, believe me, I'm not advising you to go put yourself in their church or, or anything like that. I don't think the only reason that I went is because I'm, I'm seasoned. I, I know my stuff and I can have like a, a, a conversation with them. And I'm like deep in my, in my word but as a beginner, I don't, um, I don't suggest doing what I did there, but I do say, continue to build the relationship. All right, I see another hand up. All right, Haley. It's me again, um, real quick, because I know you're going to go soon. Um, these are quick, basic, beginner terminology questions. My daughter's been here the whole time, so I've kind of lost yeah, like yeah. focus a couple of times. Um, two terms, epistles. I just need like a general understanding again on that word. It just It just means letters. Okay, like, that's what these I are thought. Paul, yeah, yeah. Paul's yeah. letters, like letters of guidance, letters of correction. Like okay. that's, that's essentially what it means. And canons. Can you explain that again? Yeah. So <laughs> canon, it it just essentially means like collection of books that are affirmed as from God. So like canon, I know I, as I was talking, I did a really bad job at at, at explaining what canon is. Um but it's that's essentially all it is like the books that we look at as authoritative the canon right so like prime example the uh marvel cinematic universe right we know that all these things connect to that universe we know that uh if there's like a dc movie that does not connect into the marvel cinematic universe right so that dc movie non canonical canonical when it comes to the MCU, right? So I hope that made sense. And I'm sure yeah. that if somebody watches this on YouTube, they're going to be like, John Clash, the false teacher, he's teaching people about the MCU and blah, blah, blah. So uh, yeah, but that's okay. uh, essentially a way you can think of it. And uh, what I'll do also is I'm just going to like write definitions in the, in the, um, in the chat as well. And also knowing that we're getting those slides, like if I had known that from the beginning, <laughs> I would have been way less stressed about trying to take, like, I would have been be able to listen more clearly, I guess. So now I'm I know. Sorry. And now going forward, like, I, I'll be more focused, but thank yeah, you. I'm going to be dropping slides and a quiz for you to, and oh. you could use the slides as a cheat sheet. So. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. All right. I see Monica has her hand up. Hello. <laughs> hey, hey, what's up, Monica? Thank you hey. so much for your shout outs of my book. I appreciate it. I appreciate your book. And I'm just super happy for you and Gio. Congratulations on, on the pregnancy. I'm so happy for Thank you both. You. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, okay. Mine's also a question, I suppose, or I'll, I'll pin it as a question. How did you get the courage to share your testimony and put yourself out there because I know I it is definitely time for me to share my testimony. If people don't share their testimony, we wouldn't have the Bible, <laughs> yeah. um, but just any words of encouragement of just like really getting that boldness and that courage to, to go forward. So I would say what made me prepared was doing things like what you guys are doing right now and studying and like really learning what it is you believe um, and being able to defend it. First Peter 3.15 says to always be ready to to give an account for what it is you believe for the for the hope that you have, right? So when you put yourself out there, you are putting yourself out there to be shot at, right? There's going to be people who are like, wow, yeah, awesome. Wow. Shout out to Monica being on the team. You know, like that's, that's, that's one, one thing that'll happen. But then you have the others of like, they just come, come at your neck. So one, just be prepared for it. Uh, that that's really it. And and two, just you don't got to be some theologian, but just know how to defend your faith. I think that that will give you more confidence in putting yourself out there, because 
when you know how to defend your faith and you know that there's a uh, good reason to believe what you believe. And it's not just some like, oh, I just have faith. You know, our faith is based on evidence, right? Uh, so when you sit in a chair, you have evidence from all the times you've sat in it before that it's not going to break, right? So that's faith based on evidence. It's the same thing with the Bible. We have faith in this because of the evidence, which is why I believe you should, uh, everyone should go watch uh, case for Christ because there's a, a boatload of evidence out there. So, and really think about it. If we believe in Christianity, like, yeah, maybe we sound crazy because we believe somebody rose from the dead, but atheists believe the universe popped out of nowhere. Like the whole entire universe came into existence from nothing. That is more crazy than me believing somebody rose from the dead 2000 years ago. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much. And just just pray, you know, just just stay in yeah. prayer. Uh, ask God to to reveal to you when you when you want to be more bold uh, about it. But what's the worst that can happen? People going to be mad at you and cry me a river, you know. <laughs> All right. Gee, I'm not even I'm not even going to pretend I know how to say your name. I'm going to need you to to just say it for me. Hold on. I, you got to hit the unmute. Oh, don't worry about it. I'm I actually have an English name. My name is my English name is Paul. And yeah. Paul. And oh, all yeah. Right. You can just call me Paul. You don't have to call my It made to... my life so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I understand. I mean, I've I have some American friends who still have hard time pronouncing Korean and Japanese names, which is Korean. I know how to count. I know how to count in Korean. Hana do set uh Wow. Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. oh, how where have... did you learn that? <laughs> I have a black belt in a cook soul one. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's cool, yeah. bro. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to start off by saying that I knew I've found out about you through uh, inspiring philosophy, AKA Michael Jones. And yeah, I was just watching some of uh, what's what was just us uh, scrolling down, like, you know, watching some of the possible reactions to uh, some of his videos. And I just came across you and I decided to check check out your YouTube channel. And you seem like a very, uh, like, it, it's really hard to find a Christian who is, uh, who is balanced. You know what I'm talking about? Because you have a, a very progressive, you have very progressive people on one side and, and the fun and the, the absolutely legalistic fundamentalists on the other. It's really, it's really hard to find the, someone who is, ba who's balanced, you know, what, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, ask my wife. Should tell you, I'm not balanced at all. But uh, I, I appreciate. It. <laughs> yeah, but still, no, I'm balanced. I would say I'm balanced in my theology. Yeah, I, I try to do a good job at understanding everyone's positions and only take hard lines on things that are, I believe are heretical right. or damaging to the body of Christ. You know? Right, right. I, I absolutely agree. But anyways, the question that I want to ask you is, um, you know. I'm actually teaching English to my Korean students. Uh, oh yeah, but here's one thing that I've noticed about most of most of the young people: they absolutely hate and loathe reading, and that includes Christian, the Christian youths. Like most of the Christian youths don't really, uh, don't even I absolutely hate reading the Bible, and it's not because they are anti-Christ, anti-Christians or anything like that. They just mm, it's let's a culture. be honest. Yeah, let's be honest. Mm. Most, I think most kids, most students, young, young teens really hate reading, especially the guys, you know. And so my question would be, um, how can we, what are some of the ways we can encourage uh, young, young people to uh, try reading the Bible? Because... We um, they could start by just listening to it. Uh, you know, the, you have the Bible apps. You also have, um, um, so I, I would say first get them interested in Jesus, right? This is me right. just, um, I'm just, uh, I have no um, qualifications for this answer of, you know, this is me just uh, thinking about how I interact with the youth in uh, like our youth group and the everyday youth that I, that I, I bump into and talk to. I would say get them interested in Jesus, right? When you can get somebody interested in Jesus and just like his story and um, sorry, I'm, I have no more battery on the camera. So you're just going to have to look at my frozen face as I'm talking. Uh, but 
you know, get them interested in Jesus, get them interested in his story. I would say um, have them watch the case for Christ, have them watch something like if they can stomach it, uh, the passion of the Christ and, and just really drive into, uh, you know, him as a person, him as a figure, him as a savior, just really focus on that. And then the reading could naturally come after it, especially when they realize they could just listen to it. They could, uh, you know, put them on to, to teachers who are into it, uh, people that you might think they resonate with, or maybe a little bit younger or, you know, you got to find constructive ways to do it. Uh, I would, but I would say the focus always on Jesus, that's the answer to everything, you know, just, just get them focused on Jesus, get them excited about who he is, what he's done and really having them understand that, that this person walked the earth. Like he, he really walked the earth. He went through all of this because he had you and me in mind. You know, and just paint that picture for them, get them interested in Jesus and then pray that the Holy Spirit just does his work. You know, I, I would say that's my answer. Uh, I'm sure somebody could probably give you a better answer, but that's that's what I got. Oh, thank you. Thanks. That was very helpful. Very insightful. Mm -hmm. All right. Anytime, all right. Paul. Thank you so much for coming on all the way from South Korea, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. All right, guys. So. I'm going to um, close it out. We're at 944. Um, if you have any questions that you weren't able to ask during this, and my camera died, so you know, I can't look at myself anymore. Um, but uh, so I, I'm just going to close it out. If you have any questions that you couldn't get asked or maybe they, they pop into your head uh, as you're going to sleep tonight, you know, your brain you're finally ready to go to sleep and your brain is like, Hey, but what about this? You know, you can uh, just go to the website and type it in that, that little form that's on there. So I'll be putting the quiz in the chat, uh, in the telegram chat, and I will be putting the slides in the telegram chat as well. And I will be um, then just helping you guys get prepared for next week. So thank you guys so much. God bless. And uh, I pray that you have a good night and I pray that you got some uh, some value out of this. So, and feel free to invite your friends. I'm also going to upload this once it's done uploading. I'm going to upload it to YouTube so people can watch the um, this one to prepare for next week if they maybe, you know, missed this week. So, all right, guys, God bless. I'll see you guys next week. Um, I don't know how to stop recording.